Now back to you as a chairperson now. It's yeah, a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jolien Rose Hesseling. I know Professor uh, Jolien Rose Hesseling already for many years. Uh, she is an expert in adult congenital heart disease. She, she's doing a lot of work on pregnancy and congenital heart disease. Uh, she is expert in, in biomarkers, uh, in imaging. So I'm uh, missing the words to say uh, with uh, what Jolene is currently uh, active. Uh, she's coming from the Rotterdam uh, group and she will present now uh, on biomarkers and learn us how to use it and where maybe the gaps are. Please, Jolene, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Werner. Thank you. And again, it's a pity we cannot be in London. I'm still here in Rotterdam, but I'm still enjoying very much to see all the friends uh, today. Well, as you know, about one in 100 children is born with heart disease. And in the 60s, only 15% survived until adult age. And due to these immense uh, contributions to better imaging, CT, MRI, echo, of course, and maybe the new imaging techniques, as Werner pointed out so nicely, and the immense um, improvements in treatment options, not only surgery, but also percutaneous interventions. Nowadays, these adults do, these children do reach adult age, and over 90% now reach adult age. But we do have a lot of white sheep, no problems. Uh, they are doing fine. They are in a good condition, um, celebrating that they're still alive. But of course, you also could have a black sheep. And how to identify the black sheep between the white sheep, especially when really? you're looking not completely clear like a very diseased patient. Jolene, excuse me, could you go to presentation mode, please? Of course, but I thought I was. I am. Let me see. Why is it not working? Is it now better? I think this is perfect now. OK. OK. Um, so the aims of our study, which we started, was a better risk prediction for complications such as heart failure, arrhythmias, and mortality. And we would like to identify the high-risk patients uh, among the patients who are doing just fine. And therefore, we started, we started the BioCon study, biomarker activity in adults with congenital heart disease. And of course, you can look at different biomarkers, uh, looking at special um, uh, effects of the heart. You, of course, have the biomarkers for heart failure. Most um, well known is the anti pro BNP, but you can also look at galactin. Um, you can look at myocardial damage. Um, I think everybody is aware that high sensitive troponin is a very good marker for myocardial damage. Inflammation markers like CRP, interleukins, TNF alpha. And we also have um, um, extracellular modeling, uh, um, a matrix remodeling, like the MMPs, the TIMP, the TGF beta, or GDF15. Well, we started the study in 2011, and we included 600 adults with congenital heart disease. And here you can see what diagnoses were included. We did not include the mild lesions, but only the moderate to complex lesions. And at baseline, we did an um, ECG, blood sampling, and um, echo. Um, the next year, only blood sampling. The second year, again, also a transthoracic echo. And again, at four, we also did an echo. And afterwards, we followed the patients um, for 100% complete but we did not do any more blood sampling or echoes. And we had a special way of transporting the lab, the blood very fast to the lab and stored it at minus 80. 
and it gives us the opportunity to study biomarkers after finishing the study, looking at different uh, points during the study. And we could, um, we have several little cusps that so we could do different studies with the material. Well, the first study was a cross-sectional analysis looking at anti-pro BNP in, uh, in these patients. And what we found that in general, anti-pro BNP is not very high, but a majority does have a little bit higher levels than in the normal population. And what you can see very clearly here is that the um, transposition patients, especially with the right systemic ventricle and the fontans have a large, um, a higher anti-pro BNP. And if you look a little bit uh, in green is a normal anti-pro BNP and in red is a very high level of anti-pro BNP and you can appreciate immediately that for instance arterial switch patients do very well in coarctation and aortic stenosis also not often have an elevated uh, anti-pro BNP while patients with a CCTGA, a univerticular heart and a pulmonary arterial hypertension most often have an elevated level of anti-pro BNP. And we could also find relationship with some other cross-sectional uh, baseline characteristics. There was a clear um, association with NIA class, with functional class, and also with the rhythm on the ECG. So if you had an atrial flutter of fibrillation, it was higher. Um, there was a an association with age and also an association with cure rest duration. And then we looked at some other biomarkers and then more in a predictive way. So we had the baseline value and we looked for events during the follow-up. And here you could see that anti pro -BNP was actually a very good marker to predict events. Um, you can see in the colors that in blue is the first quartile, so a very low anti-pro BNP, green, orange, and then in red, the fourth quartile. So this is the really elevated um, uh, quarter of anti-pro BNP. And you can see that in the highest quartile, you can see that there were much more events. There was a worse survival, um, more heart failure, more arrhythmias, and also if you looked at all events, that if you had an elevated anti-pro BNP, only 35% had no event. And what about troponin? Because of course we know that this is elevated in patients who have myocardial infarction. Um, but we found that also in adult congenital patients, this high troponin is very, very predictive of um, seeing who is going to have an event and who is not. And if you have an elevated troponin, 50% had an event. So this is also a quite good marker. Um, and, and the third one that we looked at was a GDF15, gross differentiation factor 15. And also here we found that an elevated level was predictive for events. But what one should we use or should we use all of them? And we try to also look if there was an um, um, added value of using more biomarkers. And in this graph, you can see that in blue, all biomarkers were normal. In green, only one of the three biomarkers was elevated. In orange, two of the three biomarkers were elevated. And in red, all three biomarkers were elevated. And again, a very, very convincing evidence that these biomarkers are very predictive and that the more biomarkers that are elevated, the more events do occur. Um, I think what we really should say is that this is um, over and over repeated and, and very valid uh, material, but of course, it doesn't prove that this is the only biomarkers that we have to look at. We also looked at ST2, which is very predictive in patients with heart failure. And we found striking differences between women and men. So we have to take that into account. But also here we found a good predictive value of this biomarker. And even a very simple biomarker 
like the red cell distribution width. And this is a biomarker that is quite easily available if you just uh, do a normal blood count and you do um, uh, hemoglobin, you get this for free and it is very informative. We found that it was especially elevated in the more complex patients again, like in the pul pulmonary arterial hypertension and in the univerticular heart groups. And it was also very predictive for events. So this is a very cheap and very good working biomarker. And this is from the group from Boston, who also had a really nice biobank, and they looked at C-reactive protein. And here you can see in um, red the patients who are in quartile four, the highest levels of CRP, and in, um, in black is the other three quartiles. And also here you can see that there's a clear difference between patients with an event and without an event. On the left side, you see death or non-elective cardiovascular hospitalization. And on the right side, it is all-cause mortality. And the p-value is very significant. What about serial measurements? Is that useful? Or is a single measurement more than enough? Well, because we had sing serial measurements, as I explained in the beginning, and we did the measurements every year for four years on a row, and then we followed the patients, we, we, we saw that maybe the rise in biomarker was just before an event occurred. So you could hypothetically identify patients who have a event just on forehand. It would be ideal situation, of course. Well, this was the serial measurements of the uh, anti-proBNP, and um, on the left side, it is just from the start of the study, and then in the red patients, an event occurred, and in the black patients, no event occurred, and you can see that in the patients with an event, the line is steeper. On the right side, we started with the event, and we look back, and then it was even more predictive. We also looked at CRP and also we found that if you had CMP, CRP elevated, um, this was predictive, but it was also on added value when you added it to the anti-proBNP levels. And we also looked in a specific patient population. This was in the adults with a systemic right ventricle. And here first um, you can see the events that occurred on the left side, death or heart failure. In blue is the CCTGA patients, and in red is the mustard patients. And on the right panel, this is only for death or arrhythmia. You see no clear differences between the two groups. And here we looked at all sorts of different characteristics that could be predictive of these outcomes. And if you look at the predictors for death or heart failure, we, thought, we found that the functional class was clearly predictive loss of sinus rhythm was um, not the heart rate, not the age, not the QRS duration and um, systolic blood pressure was a little bit um, uh, pre protective. And from the blood biomarkers, we found that almost all were predictive. So um, growth differentiation factor 15, high sensitive CRP, the red cell distribution with the anti-proBNP, uh, the renal function, and also the hemoglobin. And on echo, we found that tricuspid regurgitation was predictive for events, the left ventricular and diastolic dimension, the right ventricular and diastolic dimension, but not the more advanced echo parameters like st uh, strain and strain rate values. They were not predictive for outcomes. Well, based on all these risk prediction models, we tried to, um, develop a risk calculator and this was tested in a retrospective cohort from Czech Republic from the group of Jana Popelova and um, we found a fair good predictive value but not perfect therefore we also now are trying to validate it in the Boston um, biobank and here this is also a prospective study and here we find very good um, 
predictive value. So hopefully we can publish this uh, very soon. We also looked at pulmonary hypertension. And also here, these are the patients with pulmonary hypertension. Um, also here we found that several biomarkers were very predictive for events. And anti pro -BMP was the most strong predictive biomarker. And finally, we looked at a study during an intervention. And in this pro prospective study, we looked at um, adults who underwent percutaneous ASD closure. And we included five patients. And uh, they were all closed with a device. And we did a um, biomarker assessment at baseline one day after the intervention, three months after the intervention, and one year after the intervention. And what we found is that the anti pro -BMP did not differ so much during the procedure. However, troponin and also CRP, they were clearly much higher the first day after the intervention. And after that, they sort of um, normalized again. And we are not sure why these were elevated directly after closure. Maybe you have some some stress uh, during the procedure, some um, temporary release of biomarkers due to the um, involvement of the heart, but there were no clear long-term effects. But of course, this was also this could also be done for patients undergoing um, pulmonary valve implantation, for instance. So in conclusion, I think biomarkers can identify patients at high risk. And I think we really should use them much more. anti pro -BMP is very good, but more biomarkers will add, and maybe we should use more biomarkers at the same time. Also very important, if all biomarkers are normal, or only anti pro -BMP is normal, we can reassure the patients that they are very at low risk, that they will have a uh, complication or have a morbidity or mortality. So maybe we can say to these patients that they need to come to the hospital only once in every five years, for instance, or only have a video check and not come to the hospital. So in my opinion, biomarkers should be implemented in the regular care for adults with congenital heart disease or patients with pulmonary hypertension. Thank you very much for the attention. And I think we will have the questions at the end of the session, but not sure if Werner or Michael has a question already at this moment. Uh, yeah, first of all, Jolien, thank you very much for this uh, excellent work and excellent talk. Uh, this is for us as ACHD uh, specialists very important. Uh, maybe one question, uh, if I am allowed, uh, Michael. Um, if I look to some some reviews, and you put the biomarkers in the same model as imaging, it seems to be that imaging is losing field, and that the biomarker prediction is much stronger. Yeah. Is that uh, what you is that? Do you have the same feelings about this, or or or? Yeah. Did, Comment on that? I think if you saw my presentation, I am absolutely convinced that this is true. And I'm not sure why, but biomarkers are not used so often. I think many doctors don't use them at all. And they think it's very, very expensive. Anti pro BMP in the Netherlands, it costs about 20 euros. But an echo is more than 20 euros. And perhaps we should rethink this and reconsider. And, and I'm convinced that biomarkers have a really strong predictive value. And, and also by reassuring patients and not coming to the hospital, we are very, well, we will save costs. And, um, and of course there will be new biomarkers coming up, maybe even better, but I think especially anti pro -BNP, but also the, the others are very, very, um, yeah, useful and valuable. Of course, if you put all these things together in a, the big black box and you do on, on deep learning, maybe uh, there will be new perspectives in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Data, biochemistry, uh, imaging, and, and so on. So I, I, I think some very simple biomarkers like functional class 
they will still be very important and very, very useful. But for me, I, I thought that the, for instance, the strain imaging would be much stronger predictive and it seems not so predictive. I'm happy that you're a little bit in line with what I said uh, about 10 minutes ago, or half an hour ago. Yeah. 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 Um, I think it's time to go to the next speaker. Um, so it's my pleasure.